Progression 101. How does it work? We analyze the data. The data says you're doing this poorly. You change it. And guess what? You get a marginal gain. That's ultimately what progression is about. We fail so that we can learn. We fail so that we can grow. We make a mistake, we learn, we implement a process that changes that mistake and suddenly we get better as a result. Okay, I know it's oversimplistic, I really, really do it. And the funny thing is that sometimes the oversimplistic theory is not sort of bombarded enough into trades, but this is what the foundation is all about. When you have a bad day, I get it. I don't want to analyze a bad day. I don't want to sit there any longer than I have to. I just want to go and have a beer. Not that I drink beer, but my point is, I don't want to be there at that point learning, but it's the learning part that ultimately gets you to progress. Okay, now, in terms of marginal gains, I'm gonna show you six different statistics that you should be tracking, because in order to improve, in order to progress, we have to be looking at the data, raw, hard data. Now, unfortunately, traders focus on a data point called p &L, which is just a really uh, useless, gauge because why well it's output based okay you've got to focus on data that's input based because input based data is ultimately the decisions you're taking in real time and you can't control outcomes you can't control the PL so why bother trying to control it you can control your inputs though okay and there's a number of different inputs and this is not a, a full list by any means but these are some different statistics that again remember where we are we're not at foundational level now, we're at competing. So you wouldn't have heard of these statistics because no one talks about them, okay? We talk about them on the professional trading floors though. Now, ultimately what is a marginal gain? A marginal gain, you eliminate what is costing you money. That's what a marginal gain is. I was doing this, okay, you all wrote on your piece of paper three problems you're facing. I'm not applying a risk management model, therefore every year I lose $15,000 because of the lack of risk management, the cost is $15,000. You put in place a risk management model and suddenly what do you have? A marginal gain. That's what marginal gain theory is all about. Now, the six statistics that I want you to adopt and take away from it, and I'm gonna give you an idea of where I came across these statistics and how I came about to interpret them and then obviously the edge as a result. The first one is what we call controlled losses and the, the word is exactly what it says. It's something that you can control. In other words, it's a avoidable loss. Now where this idea came in my head was in year two, I remember getting to the end of the year and what I used to do, I'll show you, I'm actually going to show you my, um, uh, my journals. I'm going to show you what I was journaling like back in four, five, six years ago. And what you'll see was at the end of every day, I always kept track of this thing called a controlled loss. And a controlled loss is nothing more than a loss I could have avoided had I done the things I wanted to do. Okay, in other words, because I struggled with risk management, I wanted to use five lots, I used 10 lots, as a result I lost an additional $1,000, therefore $1,000 is a controlled loss. It's a loss I could have avoided had I just done what I should have been doing. Now, there's a number of different controlled losses. The three I've listed here for you are over-risking in particular. Then one that's not to talk about is under-risking. Okay, under-risking is a massive controlled loss. Okay, we come in, we took a big loss the previous day, we're a little bit nervous to trade. Instead of using the five lot, we use the two lot. Oh, we make money, we feel good, but you've given up an opportunity cost. Right? So under-risking is a massive controlled loss. And then the last one, moving stops. How often do we move a stop? Okay, so when we start to track these controlled losses, and what I found was in year two, I'd actually lost $24,000 to controlled losses. Now, if you just think about that as, again, a nominal number as a trader, wow, $25,000 or $24,000 in your second year, that's a significant amount of money. And when I was doing my post-year analysis, I looked at it, I was like, do you know what, if I just get rid of the controlled losses every day, or at least minimize them by 50%, how much of a marginal gain am I getting? You're all starting to understand why we want to track these controlled losses. The next thing is size efficiency, and this is something not enough traders pay attention to. And the best way, I'm going to actually show you a chart of this in a minute, but size efficiency is nothing more than when I use a five lot in the market, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about shares. When I use a hundred Apple stock, I typically trade this way. I hold the trade, I focus on the process, I'm not too worried about what the market's doing, I'm objective and I execute the trade. However, 
when I use 250 Apple shares, for some reason, monkey brain steps in, I start to maybe get out a little bit, you know, because, hey, I'm, I'm just taking some profits on the way up. Okay, we kind of lean on that psychological trick where we bluff ourselves into thinking we're doing the right thing. But what size efficiency effectively is, is how much of reward are we getting for every unit of risk are we taking? Okay, if you're willing to lose $1,000 on a trade, how much are you making for that $1,000 you're willing to lose? A very, very important unit to track. And the best thing to do is to gauge it. And I'll show you this in a minute. You want to gauge that over a spectrum of risk. In other words, what do I do when I normally have 100 shares of Apple? What do I do when I have 200 shares of Apple? What do I do when I have 500 shares of Apple? And you'll very quickly see what your psychology does. Right? And that's why we want to track this. We want to know how we're going to react when we have more size before we even get to that point. Why? Because remember what I said to you when we were talking about a coping mechanism for managing your irrational brain. The more you understand how you're going to react, when you get to that point, guess how you're going to react? In a very rational way. So it's about understanding with the use of data. Then my favorite one, real risk reward. Okay. One of the biggest flaws within our industry is people want to throw very sexy terms out there like win rate. My win rate is 50%. Okay. My risk reward is 5x and we want to talk like we're traders. It's all hocus pocus rubbish. Okay. The reality is a good day trader will have a risk reward somewhere around one to one, two to one, somewhere in that ballpark, on average over a career. Now, I want to get you away from thinking of risk reward as 1x or 2x, and I want to get you to thinking more along the lines of real risk reward. Okay, what is real risk reward? It's not what my strategy hypothetically can pay out. It's not, oh, if I run it to this target, I'm going to make 4x and therefore, you know, great trade. No. Real risk reward is actually how much reward are you making versus how much you're losing. So it's the implemented risk reward you take. Now, if you track this every day, in other words, if you were to track, I don't know, your last 100 trades, and you have your risk exposure for every trade, in other words, how much you would have lost if it hit the stop, and then you have the upside, how much you made when it, win, when it won. If you go and look at that risk reward figure, you'll start to see your true or real risk reward. It's the actual risk reward you can take from the market. Now, why does this matter? Well, because, again, how often do we find ourselves going, oh, I'm going to take a 5 to 1 year, and then suddenly we're scaling out of it, and then we wonder why we never get to 5 to 1. And everyone says, I struggle with targets. No, you don't struggle with targets. Okay? Your real risk reward is what it is, and of course you can improve it. But if you don't know what that real risk reward is, how are you going to solve the problem of you know, struggling with targets? You're not, because you don't have the data. Then the real win rate, again, another one, unfortunately gets embellished because... It sounds sexy if someone says to you they've got a win rate of 50% on a strategy. What a real win rate is, is very simple. Rather than looking at the probability of your trade making money versus losing money, look at your trade in terms of how many of your trades make more than they are going to lose. In other words, if you were to apply a $100 stop to your risk strategy, how many times are you actually going to make more than $100 on it? That's what a real... Uh, win rate is. It's ultimately how, how often are you winning more than you're actually losing on the trade in terms of risk. Okay, when you start to look at it that way, again, what you'll notice is that the win rate of a day trade is probably around 25 to 30 percent. Okay, it's only 25, 30 percent of the time that we're actually winning more than one to one. Now again, why does that matter? Well, because the moment you can get away from this illusion of 4x's and 5x's, and the moment you start to see that those are actually just outliers, you're going to start to frame things in the right way. Remember what I said to you right at the beginning, a business plan where I know my number of $400 creates this, I'm looking this way. Okay, now I can be effective because I'm limiting where I'm looking. It's the same thing here. If I know that realistically, hypothetically, I'm only going to win more than 1 to 1, 30% of the time, it starts to put things into perspective. And that's what we need more of as traders. We need more perspective. A gamble trade log, and this is one of my favorite ones. Okay, we all love a gamble. The reality is how many of your trades on a daily basis are a gamble? How many gamble trades do you take on a month? How many dollars go to a gamble trade? And are you actually profitable on your gamble trades? Most people don't know that. They don't keep a log of their gamble trades. It's a simple thing. Go in your journal at the end of every day. Today I did three gamble trades. And what is a gamble trade? A gamble trade is nothing other than an unstructured trade. In other words, we didn't have a structured strategy towards this trade. Okay, it was a feeling, an idea. So it's a gamble trade. It's something we have a very low probability understanding of. 
That's not to say you can't win or lose on it. That's not irrelevant. The point is, is that when I got to this point, I either understood it or I didn't. If I didn't understand it, log it as a gamble trade. More importantly, go and log the dollar p &L from your gamble trades and see what it does over a month, three months, and a year. And you'll start to see something very interesting, okay, which is that in the long run, your gamble trades just cost you money. Now, I'm not going to say you mustn't gamble. You must. You're a speculator. Your job is to speculate. Your job is to have a crack. Your job is to try things because when you try, you learn. But remember when we spoke about the ABC, do we learn risking 50% of the day or do, you, do we learn risking 5% of the day? Okay, that's the important thing. Apply your capital accordingly. And then lastly, identifiable structured opportunities. And this is something that was actually a coping mechanism for me when I was struggling. So what I would do in my journaling process is at the end of every day, I'll ask myself, coming into today, how many identifiable pattern plays were there coming into today? Okay, and I'd go and log it. I'd say, okay, over the course of the day, there were one or two. Then I'd say to myself, over the course of the day, how many trades presented themselves? In other words, how many plays were there today? Okay, there's a breakout. So the breakout's in play. It's a structured trade. I understand it. I know what to do. I know what my risk is. It's a structured play. And I would go and keep that log. And I'd say to myself, today, there were four structured plays. Now, the reason I did that was twofold. When I was battling, this would act as a very good way to say, don't worry about it. It was just poor performance, poor decision making. You'll come in tomorrow and guess what? There'll be a number of opportunities again. So it was a way to kind of just cope with the bad results, make sure I still debrief, make sure I still come in the next day ready to trade again. Okay, but equally, when you're on a good run, there is absolutely nothing more beautiful than when you are prepped to win the next day. You come in going, you know what, on average, these markets are throwing out three, four trades a day. You come in hungry the next day. You're ready to take opportunity. All right, so it was a very important statistic for me to pay attention to. And again, like I say to you, a lot of what we're going to discuss today might not be relevant for you. You might not go away and apply this idea of keeping track of your gamble trades or keeping track of your identifiable structured trades. At some point, though, it may be of value to you to implement it. Okay, why? Because it might add that little thing called edge. And that's what we have to do. Find the different edges. Find what it is. What do professional traders do on a daily basis? What are the little things they're trying? Not right and wrong. What are we trying that we can ultimately develop edge?